Let's look at what is happening in Nigeria as against taxation of digital economy. You know, we live in a global world and anything that has to do with the digital economy, it's very relevant. But as far as Nigeria is concerned, there are certain challenges, especially the decision by the Nigerian government not to accede to the deal being uh, proposed by the OECD communities. What will be the impact of this and what are some of the peculiar challenges being faced when it comes to taxation of digital economy in Nigeria? Let's seek the opinion of our guests who joins us virtually. We're being joined by Dr. Mrs. Titi Layofowoko, the Group Head, Strategic Tax and Compliance, Dangote Industries. And interestingly, she's also the third and the first female president of the Association of Chartered Fraud Examiners. Lagos, Nigeria chapter. Glad you have you joined us, Dr. Mrs. Fowokon. Good morning. How are you today? I'm good. It's been a while. Good to see you again. Thank you. All right. Let's look at the issue of taxation of digital economy in Nigeria. I would like you to give us an assessment of how Nigeria is faring when it comes to taxation of digital economy and what are the critical issues here that are springing up this kind of debate and conversation as regards some of the pe peculiar challenges of uh, digital taxation in Nigeria. Okay, uh, thank you very much for this uh, topic. Um, let's start from the fact that um, the issue around digital economy started with um, base erosion and profit shifting project by the OECD. Uh, we find that that people will do business in the developing countries and they shift profits out of uh, that country. For instance, Nigeria is a developing country and they have their base, their head office somewhere in the UK, the US, the big locations. And because our tax regime here is lower, so you get to see a lot of cost is, uh, uh, a lot of cost is pushed here and the profit here is reduced. So the tax paid here is lower compared to what is now paid in the, in the other country. So this is one of the things that was considered by the OECD and says, look, there are tax havens. You push a lot of profit to the tax haven and reduce the profit where the economic activity takes place. And so uh, base erosion and profit shifting projects was started in 2013. And a fallout of this is that they came up with 15 actions. Uh, one of it is the transfer pricing, which today is now a regulation that we have in Nigeria. Regulation 2018, which replaced 2012 uh, that we had. And coming to the, uh, to the area of digital economy, we know very well that you can sit in your room and do a lot of things, earn income, um, get the money into your pocket, and you don't pay tax anywhere if it cannot be tracked. And because this has come to stay, the technology level that we have now, then this has resulted into this... Um, inclusive framework, and that is to ensure that um, no country or jurisdiction is left unturned. But it's not favorable to all jurisdictions uh, with what has, they have come up. We have about 136 uh, members of OECD that signed the inclusive framework uh, on digital economy taxation in 2021, but Nigeria did not, uh, Kenya did not, I think uh, Pakistan and Sri Lanka also did not, uh, because they looked at um, some impact of this on developing countries that are not favorable. Uh, there was a two pillar solution that was come up with, and one is focused on moving the taxing rights to the market area, market jurisdiction. Uh, the second one, which is the second pillar, is talking about global minimum tax of 15%. And this also has a threshold uh, for the companies that are involved. So looking at all this, Nigeria, seem not to have that robust um, system to be able to fit in into, this, uh, into the conditions that have been put forward for this pillar one and pillar two. And we do not have a unilateral um, arrangement or, 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 or law or treaty that would make this, um, but this com income to be taxed in Nigeria. And that's what led to the amendment to our act through the Finance Act, which um, made us to have the significant economic presence to capture digital economy. This expanded what is to be covered. So when you have a domain that's .ng, 
when you provide management services, advisory services, when you have a platform that people sell through, a digital platform. Quite a lot of uh, things were put into this when the significant economic presence rule came up in 2020, uh, following the amendment of the act that started from Finance Act 2019. So the significant economic presence is able to make sure that if you have digital activities, that the, you're generating income, you're earning income, you're deriving income from Nigeria, you will have the first right of taxation in Nigeria on that income. And this is a way to address that. The significant economic presence uh, role that Nigeria has, is it any different from the OECD uh, G20 tax framework? Okay, um, the significant economic presence is tailored for our own purpose. It's not the same. Um, if we look at the OECD framework, they are saying, fine, the tax treaty rights goes to the jurisdiction where you're generating the income, where the economic activity is taking place. Then you have a global minimum tax of 15%. Now, looking at Nigeria tax environment, our corporate tax rate is 30%. 20%, uh, depending on the level of the company. For the large, it's 30%. For the medium, it's 20%. For the small, it's 0%. So, but if you look at the inclusive rate, it's saying minimum tax is 15%, and the revenue of such um, MNE has to be 750 million euro. So if you look at that, do we have any company, uh, MNE in Nigeria, who will meet up with this threshold? Or 750 euro is a tall order for us. So the significant economic presence is to address our own issue, our own peculiarity of bringing the digital economy into the Nigerian tax net. So it's not exactly the same. What it means is that if we sign into the inclusive framework, we will jettison our significant economic presence rule. And that means we will not get anything from this. Though there may be revenue globally, about 80% of this revenue goes to the global uh, to the global um, developed economy, while the minute will be shared by those of us who are in the developing economy. So this is why it's different. So the significant economic presence is our own way of ensuring that we get our own fair share of tax from multinationals that are using Nigeria for their digital um, transactions, that are using Nigeria for their platform, their sales, their, their services, their advisory, without having a physical presence. So it's not talking again about physical presence, it's talking about economic presence, significant economic presence. And that covers so many gamut of activities that non-residents do. In fact, it even went ahead to appoint non-residents as agents of collection for value-added tax, especially where you are operating. For instance, if CNN is, uh, we're paying CNN from Nigeria, CNN needs to invoice VAT to the Nigerian customers, collect this VAT, and pay to Nigerian tax authorities on, be, on, on behalf of these customers. So this is what our significant economic presence has come to do, which is different from the OECD uh, IF um, framework that, that is being proposed. And if you look at even the global revenue threshold, 20 billion, billion euros, it's really, really not, I'm not sure it's something that Nigerian, uh, any company that passes through Nigeria can be able to meet up. So that that's the peculiarity of we trying to ensure that we, retain our own fair share of tax from this uh, digital economy because of the complexity around it, which will let definitely increase rather than reduce because everybody's really going digital every day and so many things are happening in the digital economy space. Thank you. Now let's talk about this uh, OECD two pillar solution or agreement uh, which some of the, uh, the larger members signed to this and Nigeria has refused to do that. But I would like to know what has been the level of success of these two pillar solution and what are some of the challenges that's also brought out since uh, the implementation has been put in place by some of these countries who signed to this agreement? Okay, um, if you look at it, uh, the two pillar solution actually favors more the developed economy. And quite a lot of them have been able to, at least the G20, have been able to close the gaps uh, in terms of uh, what happens. And the basis is also on the subject to tax rule. Uh, if you have an income that is subject to tax in your, in your jurisdiction and you have taxed it below the global minimum rate, then it will be host on the parent company 
to be able to do the top up of whatever excess, uh, the shortfall between the minimum, the, what the tax have been paid and the minimum, um, global minimum rate. So it goes more to that jurisdiction. But where you have a rate that is higher than the global minimum rate, you're restricted to that rate. So for those jurisdictions where their rates are quite um, outside the 15% the, the global minimum rate, they tend to they tend to have some, they have to give up on some things. So it's for, for the developed companies, countries, they are getting the benefits. But for those of a developing country like Nigeria, with the type of environment we have, with the type of um, um, tax tax regime that we have, we are not likely to, we are going to have some revenue shortfall. And that is why we are not signing into this. But for the other developed countries, they have, they, in fact, it's even, if you look at the, the, the rules, they are a bit complicated. Um, amount A, amount B, and the threshold, they are very complicated. And the more the complications, the more it's difficult to implement. And also, when you now talk of you have a dispute over anything, you have to go into international uh, arbitration, which I'm not sure Nigeria would have that, um, that leverage to be able to get a, a fair, a fair uh, outcome out of it. So for countries in the developed economy, it's based them. They have the system. They also have uh, the rules that, that it's easy to implement for them. But for the developing countries, we are not um, going to get them from this. And that's why we we probably didn't pull up into the into the into the framework. Could Nigeria's refusal to endorse the deal uh, lead to trade tensions between Nigeria and countries who have signed this agreement? Um, I, I really don't think it will. Uh, it's it's a matter of um, I think Nigeria is seen as a place where everybody wants to come and do business. And I see that people will still want to come to Nigeria. Um, even at this um, inclusive framework, I'm not sure multinationals have left, except for not the tax regime that's making them to leave, but the complaints about the economy. Uh, and that is what may, may pull them up, but not really because of this um, not signing in. Uh, it could be a tough one. It could be uh, a challenge for Nigeria to be able to scale through, but... As long as we've not signed in, in, into the in framework, uh, we should still be able to have a voice uh, in terms of the... But Nigeria is actively in the OECD anyway, and they are also looking into how best uh, this can be. They can be a middle ground. It's not only Nigeria. Kenya is also there. And these are, these are countries where uh, they, they are emerging markets for, for the global economy. So um, I don't see it to be a trade war. Uh, we also have other markets opening. We have the after that is opening now, even though we don't want to restrict ourselves just to within the Africa space. But I still don't think that will make uh, investors not to want to come to Nigeria. It's just that um, there might be uh, a need for us to come to the table to see how best there can be a, a middle ground. But unfortunately, uh, four or so countries out of 139 uh, 30, or so, 140, uh, it's a, a minute number compared to those that have signed. But I believe that um, if the engagement continues, we may be able to still get some things that will be favorable. Why we will still continue with our, 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 our significant economic presence to ensure that we're not losing out. Uh, I see Nigeria as, a, as an economy that other world countries wants to come to, even with the way our government is currently pushing for foreign investment. Uh, we don't want to sell ourselves out in, in this deal but we also want to be sure that we get our fair share of tax. So that, that's what I think uh, might likely be the, the outcome. But the engagement, I, I believe, is still going on. Discussions are still on, on these areas. All right. The Federal Inland Revenue Service issued a public notice to explain that the decision for Nigeria not to sign this agreement is also in the interest of the country and to also prevent uh, revenue leakages how do you react to these and then will this be the status quo do you see nigeria shifted ground as regards this in years to come um i i, I would say that um they are right uh because looking at the way the old stop show is is based um the subjectivity uh, subjectability of um 
tax dispute to international arbitral panel. That's in panel uh, pillar one, and that's a cause for concern. Um, but I believe that as we go along, you know, there is no way you would always be at extreme ends. But when we start looking at some other conditions, because we cannot afford, the current government is looking at generating enough revenue to be able to meet the needs of the people, provide infrastructure and the likes. So the revenue drive is key for any government. And there could be also areas where there can be a win-win, which is what is making the FRS to continue to engage with the tax authority, with the, at, at the OECD level. We're still very much uh, in the OECD uh on the on other aspects uh whether nigeria will shift ground in future uh it's a bit i would say it's not likely to be a major shift uh it might likely be a consensus on some areas uh, but in terms of totally shifting ground may i don't see that happening because the need for us to meet up and and overcome our negative uh, a deficit budget is there the need to generate more tax revenue is also focus of the government so as much as and we and we have these MNEs that come to our country they have businesses here uh unfortunately we are more of capital importing uh than capital exporting but if we are able to turn the table around and have nigeria to turn to capital exporting nation where we can also go to those jurisdictions it will be good but we need to also do our own work they're not exporting capital, and the old tax is being the old income. Uh, we are giving so much benefit here, and the old income is being enjoyed uh, at the other countries that are there. So it's, it's likely Nigeria would get to a state whereby we can have a win win situation as they continue in the talks, uh, but not necessarily that would jeopardize our revenue generation because that is key to the success of the government of the nation. Thank you. All right, so from the tax agreement uh, that was uh, made by the OECD, it doesn't look like the interest of developing countries was much considered. How do you think developing countries can have better representation and their interest can be put forward, well addressed by whatever agreement that is made at such forum? Um, I, I would say that um, currently, even with the action that Nigeria has put up, with Kenya and some other countries, like I said initially, Nigeria is like the bride of the of the nations. People want to. We have an environment. We have investment opportunities here. So I, I want to believe that as we go along in attracting this investment inflow, we should not lose focus on the benefit to the country. We can actually get to a stage whereby when we discuss at different fora because we need to be involved. We can't pull out. We may not sign the agreement, but that doesn't mean that we'll pull out of the discussion because we have to represent the interest of so many in, uh, Nigerians that are looking up to the tax authorities. So for, non for, for, for developing countries, they need to also look at what fits their own purpose. You know, we need to move away from copying what others are doing that is not beneficial to us to having our own peculiarity, standing by it, and not making sure that we lose sight of the objective of whatever we are doing. We started with significant economic presence. People are complying anyway, because a lot of people are doing business with Nigerian companies. They are complying. And I know the government is realizing as much revenue as possible. And because of even the trend of tax compliance, you know, no company wants to be penalized. If you look at it now, um, the tax authority, the FRS have gone digital when it comes to VAT. And VAT is one of the areas where SCP is, we have uh, VAT self-charge. Uh, we have VAT with, withholding VAT, which is when you deal with a non-resident, you have to assess the VAT withhold and remit. Now, if you fail to do that within the time frame, the penalty kicks in and the interest. And you look at the amount of penalty. If you're dealing with a 1 billion transaction, the VAT you're supposed to pay maybe 100 million, you refuse to pay on time or we do not be told, you do not do this, you are having a 10% of that as penalty at the first instance and the interest will come on top of that based on the uh, prevailing rate. So you that you are here dealing business with any foreign company will not want to go into that penalty net. So you want to do it right. And everybody's enlightening their 
vendors and I think their different stakeholders on why they need to avoid the penalty. These penalties are also not allowable for income tax purposes. So you are going to be punished twice. So at the moment, Nigeria is still making a headway in terms of implementing the significant economic presence and is still able to guard its, its loins over losing that revenue. So it's still working for us. But maybe as the economy uh, economic situation changes, there may be need to look at, okay, how, best, how far have we gone in implementing the significant economic presence? What has been the trend of our revenue base? Have we had more people in the tax net? And then do an assessment to see if there's need to review the process or tighten it or relax it. It all depends. But the, the revenue uh, focus cannot be removed from whatever is to be done. So developing countries have to look at how best to do their thing in a way that fits their economy, at the same time, not losing sight of an, any area where they need to have a win-win situation. Now, let's, let's address this debate or the key challenge of whether to tax these businesses based on where value is created or where value is consumed. If you look at the peculiarity of taxation of digital, uh, digital companies, there's that debate ongoing whether to tax those businesses based on where value is created or where value is consumed. What's your take on this? Uh, well, um, if, if you look at um, the issue around value creation and value consumption, quite a lot is being moved from where value is created because Value consumption, value creation has to do it. You have a lot of resources that you are put in at the value creation and the jurisdiction where value is created needs to be recognized. Otherwise, you're going to be dipping them, digging deep into them. If you do a lot within a country and you push it out to another country and that country is not getting a fair share, then they are losing out. So we need to be mindful of value consumption is more is, has been done at the value creation level than value consumption level. So there must be commensurate compensation to where value is created. And I think that is what this is, is all about. Where we are saying when you do your business through any digital platform in Nigeria, carrying and .ng, then we should have a right to tax in it. So that is an area where I believe the value creation really carries a lot because quite a lot is done at the value creation level rather than the value consumption. And that is why the Nigerian SCP is trying to address it from that point of view, saying you provide services, you do that, but then you need to look at that. So it's um, it requires a, 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 we look at, okay, fine. Why would um, profits escape from where money is parted with? You know, why would you take everything away? and then that country would be losing out. So it's really um, an area of trying to see how do we balance the two? And this is the main risk. Now the gap with the SCP, we try to close the gap. If you look at, for you to provide, you are providing services from a non-resident to a, a, a Nigerian company. The issue of VAT on consumption comes in. So you pay your VAT. Now, if you are now talking about you're sitting here, you're using the resources here, you're using everything, you're using the platform, you're generating value, and all that is going, and you're not giving back to that environment, then it's also a challenge. So I, I think it's a debate that will continue. Uh, it's a conversation that will continue. And as long as we're still here to find a final landing on it, that risk is still there uh, until when we are able to, to close the gap. So even though Nigeria has used Finance Act 2020, 2021, to try to manage this risk. I believe it is a discussion that will still continue uh, as the digital economy evolves and as uh, things um, unfold. How does the OECD G20 uh, agreement affect countries that are known as tax havens? Okay, um, you know, the, the part of what is being, being done is to also look into aggressive tax um, planning. Some of them have been listed uh, for blacklisting if they don't fall in. And I know quite a lot of them now have changed their tax regime. I know countries like Bermuda, 
uh, were seen as an a tax haven where people push everything to. So now in Bermuda, there's reporting, even though there's still no tax payment, but now they report transactions that happens in that regime. Uh, Dubai was also listed as one of the countries where people used to do um, to shift profits. Uh, now Dubai now has rep tax reporting. Uh, currently, I know they've started to bring in, though there's no income tax, but I know there's uh, goods and services tax that is happening there now. So for these countries that um, have been listed as tax haven, they are also looking into their, they don't want to be blacklisted anyway. They don't want um, to be labeled as um, a jurisdiction that is anti-progress. Permit me to use that word to other countries. So they are also looking at how best can they be transparent in what is being done. We've seen a lot of things that have happened when people move their assets to those countries. The Nigeria had a time when they had a voluntary asset uh, declaration, and we have so many countries saying Nigerians have assets here, they didn't declare it, and that went on. So with that trend of things, um, the OECD inclusive framework has actually made a lot of them to come to the limelight, and they are also looking at their, their tax regime to see how best uh, they, they come in, even though they are not really saying income taxes will be fully uh, paid by people, but at least on other areas where they can block the necessary leakages and still fall in line with the inclusive framework because they don't really have tax to pay, but the minimum tax will affect them, uh, especially where people are moving profit to those jurisdictions and they are not subject to tax. So the subject to tax will also affect any income that goes to that. So they are also looking at how best they can align with what is going on in the, in the OECD inclusive framework. All right. Earlier, you made reference to Finance Act of 2020. I would like to know what are the, you know, the provisions of this act as regards taxation of companies or who are in the digital economies in Nigeria, and what has been the level of compliance when it comes to these criteria? Okay. Um, I, for those companies, I think the finance are very clear as to defining uh, what are the countries affected? It says, um, just permit me to say, it says companies with turnover of foreign data company involved in, these are the services covered, transmitting, emitting, receiving signals, sound messages, images, or data of any kind by cable, radio, electromagnetic systems, or any other electronic or wireless apparatus to Nigeria in respect of any commerce, trade, or activity, including electronic commerce, application store, high-frequency trading, electronic data storage, online advert, participative network platform, or online payments to the extent that the company has significant presence in Nigeria. So once any activity falls inside this for the digital services, then it will come under similar economic presence. So what that means is, if I'm dealing with um, any, for instance, let me take Google. Let me take Facebook and all these platforms. They are now captured under the significant economic presence based on this. And also, if I have to patronize LinkedIn, they are captured under significant economic presence. So the responsibility is on me, who is a Nigerian company, to ensure that I apply the rules, for instance, Whatever I'm paying them is subject to withholding tax. They need to have a registration. Thank God FRS now have it online. Nigerian companies have to ensure that is done. They are liable to charge VAT on their services. I, as a Nigerian company or Nigerian beneficiary, needs to ensure that that is done, file my returns. And that is why under the VAT regime, we have the normal input output VAT. We have the VAT self-account. And we have this VAT self withholding. These are all now captured by the FRS on the platform for VAT. So compliance have been on the high side. So some of them, even in their jurisdiction, they cannot be seen not to comply with the laws. Some will even get consultants in Nigeria who will advise them and assist them with filing. I can say categorically, LinkedIn, for instance, would tell you, give me evidence of withholding tax deducted on my invoice. Um, things like Microsoft, firms like Microsoft, uh, CNN, the likes, they now know that they have to collect VAT. So when they invoice, they apply the Nigerian VAT, 
which is going to be remitted if they are a collecting agent to be remitted to them. And if they are not a collecting agent, then that VAT has to be remitted and remitted to the tax authorities. So these are the level of compliance has increased between then and now because it comes with punishment. You don't go by the rules of the law, you have penalty and you don't want to be seen to be penalized because that's additional cost of doing business. So um, everyone now is going by complying with the rule as it is today. SCP has come to stay. Uh, taxpayers are conscious of it. And those who are not conscious of it, when they have tax audits and they raise these issues from them, they now know, oh, I should have done this, but they will pay for it. And the payment for it is that the penalties for not paying, uh, paying attention to the new rule. So there's quite a number of compliance that is going on. People know better now uh, on the SCP, at least this is 2020, 2021, this is 2024. So it's nothing new again. And so till when any changes are made, everybody is still complying with the provision of the SCP rule. So I want to say compliance is increasing, uh, awareness is increasing, and uh, for, the, for the beneficiary of the services of this of these uh, non-resident companies, because you don't want to be penalized, you are also forced to tell them, sorry, this is a new rule in Nigeria. You get a pushback, but you have to also push back to say, sorry, this is the rule, and we have to be compliant, we have to be seen, and we have to be compliant. And you don't have, they don't have a choice. If that's the law of the land and they still want to do business with you, they would surely comply. All right. According to NIDA, the Nador digital economy has attracted about $4.4 billion over the last four years. Now, looking home now or looking internally, uh, there are some aspects of the Finance Act that needs to address the digital economy to ensure that Nador gets as much as it can from the digital economy. For instance, the personal income tax, uh, which uh, the government was talking about applying for individuals uh, operating within the digital economy. But some have also criticized it as it's been uh, uh, too much or it, it, it's like taken from uh, people who may have in one way or the other paid tax in their space, the, the, in the digital space that they operate. Okay, I, I think the significant economic presence addressed both the corporates and the personal income um, based on the clarification that is provided. Now, we need to also know that um, personal income tax applies to partnership, applies to individuals, applies to registered businesses. So where you fall on that category, apply to trust, apply to estates and the likes. When you fall into any of these categories, and you're a non-resident individual, you are seen to be doing business in Nigeria, you're seen to be carrying on business activities through any of these platforms, then it behoves on you to obey the rules of the game. Now, you are deriving income, that income fine may be taxed. And I, I can I accept that there may be some areas of double taxation, because especially where there is no treaty with, between Nigeria and the country or, and the host country of that individual. But, but where we have treaties, especially majority of people that do business with Nigeria are from the likes of the UK uh, and the likes of the France, Pakistan, uh, and, and I think Philippines, we have treaties. Though it's not enough, where people say that treaty network is not enough, uh, which could be better, we could increase that network uh, so that it can expand the base in which we do businesses with people. But if you look at it from that angle, even if you pay tax in Nigeria, you can always get a relief in your country. Same for corporates. So if you are arguing that for individuals, it's like you're taxing them, they've already been taxed in their space. Corporates will also argue the same thing. But there's always a, a you need to also look at first right to tax. Where is this income being derived from? And based on a Nigerian rule, income derived from received in accrued or brought into Nigeria is liable to tax. So we look at from the derived from, you look at the accrued in, then uh, these individuals need to pay their right, their right share of tax. Let me mind, mind my word, their right share of tax to Nigeria for the income they are deriving from here. Otherwise, the revenue that Nigeria should have gotten would have been shifted. And mind you, non-residents are not under the uh the the states per se. They are under the federal federal capital territory. So they, their revenue goes to the FCT IRS because they are, they are not resident in Nigeria. So I believe that if you've generated income, you've earned income, then you need to pay the tax. 
and see how best you can get um, your relief under the double tax. For the likes of US, for instance, I know there are credits that have been given uh, to their residents for taxes they paid in foreign jurisdiction. So I, I want to believe that apart from um, you paying your tax, you can also get some relief under the tax regime. And for those within the Commonwealth, there are some reliefs under the Commonwealth tax regime which can also be benefited from so that Nigeria can have its own fair share of tax from these different um, juris um, activities, jurisdiction, um, businesses that goes through our land. And the key thing is, even after collecting these taxes, we pray that there will be accountability, there will be responsibility, and Nigerians will be able to say, yes, we can see what the tax money is doing for us. All right, Dr. Titi Lai of Owokon, we just have to let you go now. It's always delightful and always educating having you talk to us on early exchange. So we want to appreciate you for your time. Thank your you very much. on the issue of digital taxation. Thank you so much for your time and commitment. Thank you. Thank you. Have a lovely day. Have a lovely week weekend ahead. Thank you. Early exchange. Shaping policy, advancing development.